1274 BC, a young Egyptian pharaoh, Ramses II, led an army of 20,000 men against 40,000 soldiers from the Hittite Empire. I'm Matthew Settle. Both sides would fight one of the earliest recorded battles in history at Kadesh. At stake, the security and prosperity of Egypt. More than 3,000 years later, this is all that remains of the Syrian settlement where 60,000 men fought for their lives in the Battle of Kadesh. Now, with new video game technology, you are about to see this great battle as never before. The vast numbers of soldiers, the troop formations, how they fought, and how the battle was won. Get the view the generals wish they had. Now, on Decisive Battles, Three thousand years ago, in 1274 BC, Syria was the crossroads of the ancient world, where the trade routes from the west met those from the east. Timber, gold and spices from the east were traded for copper and tin from the west. Syria has been a battleground throughout most of its history. It's where three continents meet. It can't defend itself. It can't produce a big state of its own. But it's therefore always a target for the superpowers. To the south of them was the Egyptian superpower, to the north, the new superpower on the scene, the Hittites. The city of Kadesh was on the borderland, where the Egyptian and the Hittite empires met. Both Ramesses and the Hittites want to take Kadesh. Kadesh is important because it actually controls trade routes over land. It allows access south if you're coming from the Hittites, or north if you're coming from Egypt. For nearly 200 years, the Egyptians and the Hittites had fought for control of central Syria. The Hittites' power base was the Anatolian highlands of modern-day Turkey. Egypt was a desert kingdom, totally reliant on the fertile strip along the River Nile, which was maintained by annual floods. Egypt was run by a sun king, a pharaoh who was a god upon earth. It was the first centralized state in history. On the whole, it was rather isolationist. It thought it knew best. Foreigners were inferior, but foreigners had to be kept in check. In 1482 BC, Pharaoh Tutmosis III had defeated the Hittites in the Great Battle of Megiddo. But most confrontations were on a much smaller scale, and massive military encounters like this were rare. Then in 1279 BC, the 25-year-old Ramses II was crowned pharaoh of Egypt. Ramesses II is an absolutely fascinating character and he left his mark up and down the Nile. He was a great one for carving his name into things, building monuments, leaving statues. We even have his body. So we feel that we know a lot about Ramesses. We know something of Ramesses' physical appearance because his mummy has survived. He was tall for an ancient Egyptian, probably around 5'7" and he probably had red hair, the result of earlier intermarriage with Asian peoples. To be pharaoh was absolutely the best job there was. It meant that you were a demigod, you weren't just a person, you were the richest man in the world, you were the most powerful man in the world. Ramses had already had his share of military experience. As a very young crown prince, he had campaigned with his father, Seti, in Libya and Syria. Seti had captured the strategic city of Kadesh in Syria, but it had fallen back into the hands of the Hittites. Recapturing Kadesh would now show that he was a great commander, as great as his father, and would give him access to east and west trade routes. Ramesses was a young man for whom the horizon had no frontiers at all. He decided what dad couldn't do, I will do. He was going to be it. And he had all the ambition of youth. Ramesses II was a young man in a hurry. He wanted to be not merely a pharaoh, he wanted to be the greatest pharaoh there ever had been or ever would be. He wanted the gods to know that they had a super pharaoh on their hands. The Hittite king, Muwatalis, he's not been on the throne that long himself. He gets enraged when Ramesses says that he's going to claim back Kadesh, which he regards as his own territory. 
the father of Muatali and Ramsi's father Seti had fought one another. Now both sons would settle their unfinished business. Muatali called for troops from all parts of his empire and produced one of the largest armies ever fielded by the Hittites. 2,500 chariots and 40,000 infantry. What makes Kadesh, I think, very interesting in that we have two people who think that they can't be beaten coming up against each other. Ramses' strategy would have come as no surprise. His plans to capture Kadesh were openly discussed at the Egyptian court. If Ramesses II had had primetime television, he would have gone on it and said, I intend to conquer Kadesh and kick the Hittites out of Syria. I have no doubt that uh, the news that came back from Egypt would also tell Mutalis the character of the young king. This man's only 25, this man thinks he can do anything, this man is impetuous, this man's in a hurry, and Mutalis might even be rubbing his hands saying, right, we know how to deal with this sort of sucker. Campaigning always took place during the spring and summer so that there was a ready supply of food for an army on the march. The armies of this period were built around infantry and chariots. Charioteers were like modern-day fighter pilots, the top guns of their time. To be a chariot driver was a bit like being a test pilot or something like that. It was a job that people wanted. It had prestige, it could lead to great rewards, it attracted all the girls in the neighborhood. They also had to supply and maintain their own chariots and horses. The chariot was a formidable assault weapon designed to smash into and break through enemy infantry. It was also a mobile firing platform and carried a driver and an archer. The two main weapons of the charioteer were the spear, designed for close-up work once the chariot was amongst the enemy, and the composite bow. We have an account of an Egyptian pharaoh using a composite bow, drawing the bow and firing the arrows through a target of solid copper. The arrows went through the solid copper and came out the other side onto the ground. These things were armor-piercing weapons. They could do a lot of damage. The chariot was designed to be used in close contact with the enemy, which meant that the enemy could quite easily shoot them up. The Egyptian chariot had some advantages over the Hittite vehicle. It was lighter and more maneuverable. It was driven by only two horses and carried a driver and a warrior. Again, spears and bows were the choice weapons. Both sides were fairly evenly matched in weaponry. The Hittite foot soldier carried a long thrusting spear and a short stabbing dagger. And although iron had made an appearance by now, the major hand weapons were the bronze sickle sword and the bronze battle axe. The Hittites were a formidable fighting force, but they didn't scare Ramses, who referred to them as the effeminate ones because of their long flowing hair. In mid-April 1274 BC, the Egyptian army assembled on the city of Pi Ramses on the Nile Delta. It must have given the whole country a huge lift because this is exactly what pharaohs are supposed to do. They're supposed to assemble huge armies, reinforce Egypt's superiority and march off. From there, it was a month-long march to the battlefield on the plain of Kadesh. The outcome would make or break the young pharaoh and decide the future of Egypt. In 1274 BC, Ramses II, Egypt's warrior pharaoh, is marching against the Hittite Empire. At stake, the riches of Syria and the security of Egypt. The Egyptian army was divided into four corps. Each had 4,000 infantry. Another 1,000 men crewed the 500 chariots attached to each corps. By the time of Ramesses, the Egyptian army was formed into four big divisions. They were named after some of the main gods of the kingdom. The four corps were the Amun from Thebes, the Re after the sun god from Heliopolis, the Set after the storm god of the Nile Delta, and Ptah, the creator god. Each corps was commanded by a general, with the pharaoh as overall commander-in-chief. 
In battle, these men would form a kind of early phalanx, with experienced troops at the front and raw recruits at the back. On the march, the corps did not group together as a single army, but traveled as independent units, often strung out over miles of desert. This system had evolved because the pharaoh hardly ever fought large pitched battles. His short, localized wars were usually fought by one corps at a time. Also split up over a wide area, it was easier for the army to live off the land. For the entire regiments of Amun, and then Ray, and then Ptah, and then Seth, we need something like, I think, um, oh, a mile and a half or two miles range of force traveling up through Canaan and Galilee. The Egyptian army marched north while an elite division, drawn from all four corps, moved along the coast. By late May, Ramses was just a day's march away from Kadesh. He was leading the Amun Corps, which had raced miles ahead of the rest of the army. Shortly after daybreak, he struck camp and set out to reach the city by nightfall. Though both kings knew where the battle would be fought, neither knew exactly when it would begin, and neither knew exactly where the opposing army was. That night, Ramses' soldiers found two Bedouin. Under heavy interrogation, they maintained they had not seen the Hittite army. When Ramses heard that the Hittites were nowhere to be seen, he thought that his wildest dreams had all come true at once. There was Kadesh, he could simply walk into it, take it, and everything would fall into place. Ramses breathed a sigh of relief. He now had time to rest and feed his men and wait for the other course to catch up. He set up his tent and sat inside on a throne of gold. But Ramses was in for a shock. The next morning, two Hittite scouts were captured. They refused to talk, but after a brutal beating, they were dragged before Ramses and blurted out the truth. The Hittite army was not days away. They were more numerous than the sands of the riverbanks, and they were lying in wait behind a nearby hill. Ramses was horrified. The Hittites were within striking distance, and he had only one corps of troops. 5,000 Egyptians against Muwatali and his 40,000 Hittites. Why we know what happened next is what makes Kadesh so significant. Kadesh is the oldest recorded battle that we can accurately reconstruct. A contemporary poem to the pharaoh contains a narrative of the Kadesh campaign, and the walls here in the Ramesseum at Luxor are covered with scenes from the battle. Ramses sent messengers to the other three corps ordering them to make speed to the pharaoh at Kadesh. But it was the following morning before the Ray Corps was alerted. They immediately began a forced march to pharaoh's camp, with chariots out front of the infantry. But as they came closer, hundreds of Hittite chariots raced out of hiding and smashed into the Egyptian infantry column. It must have been a vision of chaos. Heavy Hittite chariots coming from the side against a division not in battle order. Heavy arrows, heavy swords, blood curling cries, dust, and sudden death coming out of the sky. The Ray Corps collapsed into chaos. Many just dropped their weapons and ran for it. The men who were meant to rescue the Pharaoh had run away. Ramses was trapped. With just a quarter of his troops, it would only be a matter of time before he was overwhelmed by the Hittite army. Twelve seventy-four B.C. The Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II is battling the Hittite Empire for control of Syria. The Raykor infantry had been cut to pieces. There was little the charioteers at the front could do. Then they saw another mass of Hittite chariots headed straight for Ramses' camp. They galloped to warn the pharaoh and made it to the camp just in time. 
Ramesses was still in his tent, still shouting at his generals, still trying to apportion blame and sort out the mess, when suddenly there was an influx of Egyptian chariots followed by two and a half thousand Hittite chariots and it was just complete panic. The Hittite chariot crashed through the defences and a bloody fight began with the defending infantry. But as they rolled into the camp, they were slowed down by the numbers of tents and equipment. Chariots collided with one another in a confined space. There is blood, there is dust, there is looting, because Egyptian gold and silver artifacts were very valuable throughout the Near East. The chariots were now caught in a huge traffic jam. Even worse, the Hittite chariots had been so eager to charge into the Egyptian camp that they had left their infantry far behind. The Hittite infantry outnumbered the Egyptian soldiers by two to one, but they were nowhere near the battle. Egyptian archers began firing into the mass of chariots. Egyptian foot soldiers hauled the Hittites from the chariots by their long hair and slashed them across the throat. The slaughter was constant and brutal. Now Ramses took control. Seizing his chance, he led the remainder of his chariots out of his camp at a fast gallop and swept round in an arc in a counterattack on the Hittites. There were only two things to do. One was to hope that reinforcements would somehow appear. The other was to charge straight at the Hittite lines and show how brave you are. Ramesses was naive. He was misguided in many ways, but he was brave. He prays to the warrior god, who he calls his father, and pleads that he will not desert him in his critical hour. Then he charges. Luck was on Ramses' side. With incredible timing, the chariots of the elite division from the coast arrived to join the battle. They had sped on ahead, leaving the infantry behind. Ramesses was moved from a position of being very much the underdog to having elite troops burst on the scene frighten the wits out of the Hittites who didn't know they were there. Suddenly the whole battle turned around. Of course the Hittites had no idea how many more troops there might be out there. The Hittite chariot teams were exhausted, were being cut to pieces by powerful arrows from thousands of composite bows. The lighter Egyptian chariots were faster and more stable than their enemies. Keeping out of range of the Hittites' javelins, they fired volley after volley of arrows into the densely packed chariots. What the Egyptians can do is fire arrows at them, and they cannot manoeuvre and fight back. It is what is called a turkey shoot. Every time the Hittites tried to get a grip on the Egyptians, they were driven back by the hail of arrows. There was nothing left but to make a break for it. The retreat turned into a headlong rush for safety. Broken chariots and screaming and dying horses littered the ground. The Egyptian foot soldiers following in the wake of the chariots finished off anyone they found alive. When an Egyptian soldier killed a Hittite, he would cut off the dead man's right hand. This was then taken to the pharaoh as proof of victory. After the battle, the pile of hands was counted to calculate the number of enemy dead. The Egyptian system of military organization had almost lost the battle. Thousands of soldiers had been strung out over miles of desert. The pharaoh had never been able to gather all his troops together and throw his full military might against the Hittites. But things had been worse for Muwatali. He had brought 40,000 Hittite infantry to Kadesh. None of them fought in the battle. Both he and Ramses had fought a completely different battle than the one they had planned for. Ramses could not hope to hold territory in Syria with his small army. He fell back to Egypt and eventually signed a peace treaty with the Hittites. Later, he took two Hittite princesses as wives. This resulted in peace and prosperity throughout the area for the next 90 years. I think from the Kadesh battle inscriptions, we get a genuine sense that he stepped out of the mythology. He stopped being 
the demigod and he actually became a man who was on a battlefield and who was frightened and yet managed to fight his way out of danger. In the Hittites of one, the entire area of what we call Palestine would have fallen under their rule. Large parts of the Bible are to do with Egypt. We might not have had any of that. We wouldn't even have the Bible in the form in which it's written for us. It might have been written in Hittite. Ramses himself ruled for another 70 years, giving Egypt a rare period of continuity. During his long life, he took 200 wives, had 96 sons and 60 daughters, and his luck held. Throughout his reign, the Nile regularly flooded, giving good harvests. But in 1274 BC, none of this had been certain. Ramses knew that the Battle of Kadesh had played a big part in making it possible. The young pharaoh had made his reputation and secured Egypt's borders, and he never wanted his people to forget it. He ordered the walls of his temple here at Luxor, the Ramesseum, to be inscribed with scenes from the battle. Today, more than 3,000 years later, people come from all over the world to read the story of Ramses and the Battle of Kadesh. <laughs>